I anything happening. Hello. Hello. We're live. Are we live? We are live. Excellent. I'll just check. Something's happening there. Yeah. I think we're brilliant. Thank you. Excellent. Hello. Well. Yeah. Yeah, you're live, Roger. Go ahead. I see you on YouTube and everything. All right. Okay. Thank you. Welcome, everybody, to the next installment in anti relativity. And this is part two. I've got lots of information on people rebelling against Einstein's relativity. And hopefully, I get to be able to show it all. Um, this one is going to be about the Sanak experiment. And various people think that Sanak experiments disproves special relativity. But I put a question mark on the end because it's arguable. So if I can now go to my slides by way of introduction to a video talk I'm going to show. Share screen. What's it say? So, hello. Oh, I got the options here. Yeah. PowerPoint. Yeah. Okay. So, allow. There we go. So, I want to sh sh show this uh, sh short presentation. I'll go through the from beginning. So, this is. Uh, uh, Anti-relativity part two. Sanak effect disproves special relativity question mark. Um, there are various dissidents, that is, uh, people who oppose Einstein relativity that think the Sanak effect disproves special relativity. And I want to look at what I think is a good talk on that perspective. That there is other literature and talks by distance covering the same issue. So there used to be a SANAC award offered to dissidents in our society, John Chappell Natural Society, but I don't really understand what happened to that. And that was for outstanding work they've done, like lifetime award or doing experiments which uh, show Einstein is wrong. Uh, but anyway, carrying on, from my perspective, special relativity is not a properly defined theory. And how it would deal with the Sanat experiment, I think, is not clearly defined. But there are people who think otherwise. Hence this uh, talk. The person giving the talk thinks the Sanat experiment disproves uh, special relativity. Uh, next. So this is a relevant person. It's a Dr. Ulbrick Gies. I don't know if I pronounce the name properly. He's from Hamburg. And the relevant paper he's written is entitled Ongoing Problems with Special and General Relativity and Solutions. And in the abstract, he says it will be shown that a certain configuration of the Sanak experiment disputes Einstein's theory of relativity. And what I think happens is you can get uh, um, articles published in quite respectable places uh, criticizing uh, Einstein's relativity, providing you don't just come out straight away and say Einstein's relativity is wrong. If you present it as more of a case, as there's a problem, as this person has done, when I mean, he calls it on, ongoing problems of special general relativity, uh, that makes it sound more respectable. But at the end of the day, he's taken the position, I think, that Einstein is wrong. Uh, next. 
So this is the video talk and it's uh, entitled The Sanat Effect Disproves Einstein's Relativity and he gave this talk in 2023. He deals with special relativity in a great deal of detail and then goes on briefly to deal with general relativity but he loses me with the general relativity and I think that is that part of the talk is too short and really it would need a much longer talk to deal with that. So the bit I like is the special relativity part of the talk and that's which I'm going to just show. And of course I'm going to assume that most people here have a fair understanding or rough, rough understanding of what special relativity is and hopefully a bit about the Sanak experiment so they would appreciate his uh, perspective on things. So this should be the last, should be the last slide. Good. Uh, right. Close that little talk, and we will go to the uh, video now. I start the video here. Right. Here we go. Here we go. This is the Sanat effect disproves Einstein's relativity. Uh, presented by all brick geese. We don't see the video yet. You don't see the video? Okay. Yeah. So what's going on there? Is it, oh, it's, I probably have to do the other bit. Yeah, you have to share your work, the window that's got your... Uh, I've got to share that one. Okay. Okay. I just said share and thought it, it, it... Yeah. So I've got to do the other share. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, they're talking on that. Well, I, I do. If it's me, I just uh, I do. Uh, can you see the video? No, we still still seeing the PowerPoint. All right. Uh, slides. Best. Present. Where's that? Video file. There you go. No, not that one. No, I think you just want to do a uh, share screen, share full screen, and then, uh, have your video visible to you. Stop screen. Again, percent. Let's go. Share screen, and then it's. it's fortunately, my eyes are so bad. Uh, Streamline. And share screen. And we want to present. You want to say share screen. Entire screen. Let's say entire screen and then Hello. The audio. And that's it. We're on that now, and we should be able to see the video. You seen the video? Not yet. It's coming up, I think. Okay. Yeah, we see the video now. Okay. You might want to make so, that full screen. Yeah, full screen. Cheers. Okay. Good. Let's start. And you want? Yeah. There you go. Give it a go. Um, I don't hear the audio. It, yeah, we're not getting the audio. So okay. Go back and make sure that you, you check to uh, share the audio. I share audio. Uh, Where's the share audio thing? Well, I think you have to stop presenting and then just start over again. Uh, is it stop screen? Yeah, stop screen and then go back into present. Present. And then go and Sh share on, screen. And then click on entire screen. And uh, let me see here. To share audio. Oh, it says you have to share a tab in order to get the audio. So I guess you're going to have to go and say, once again, present, share screen, and then it'll say like Chrome tab or something. Or, uh, I, I got entire screen there. Okay, so. you don't want to click entire screen. You want to click on share, share tab. Share tab. 
You see something like that? And one of them no. should be a YouTube. I don't see that. I've got StreamYard Studio. Is that it? Mozilla, Firefox? Hello? Are you using Firefox? I think so. Yeah. Hello. Let's see what that does. Okay. Is that it? Do you see it? Uh, play it. Let's see. No, we're still not getting any audio. Oh, I, I, I think oh it might dear. be easier, uh, gentlemen. Um, if you have that file, that that file on your desktop, for example, Roger, and then you yeah. should share that rather than share your screen, because I think sharing your screen is just giving you the video. Yeah, other the or you can just chat me the link and I can try sharing it. We were able to do that last week. Last okay. time. I know why that wouldn't work for you today, but oh. let's see. Oh. Yeah, you probably want to stop sharing your screen now, I suppose. It's, uh... Is it still doing it? Oh, okay. Stop share screen. There you go. Yeah, back there. What? Well, you can also just chat comments directly into the into StreamYard. Yeah. Okay. The email it to me. Hold on. Oh. Nothing. So rather than uh, when you click present, rather than say share screen, share video file, and then search for where that video file is on your system. I think oh, that should be. It's YouTube, so he doesn't have a video file. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, then he'll have to get to that some other I've, I've sent the link through, is it, to the comments. I got the link there. Let's see if I can actually click on it. <laughs> you know, this is frustrating because yeah. I can't really, you know, I can put the link up there, right? but I can't copy it. Put that, it, needs be, it needs to be put in like the private chat or something where I can copy it from. Private chat. Uh, I'll just search for it. Yeah. You just type in the words uh, Sanac effect disproves Einstein's relativity. I think it goes to that link anyway. It doesn't. I'm just going to have to type it in. Now, this is just really frustrating that I <sighs> copy anything out of the, the, the chat thing there. Yeah. Watch as V equals E M X J V C T K H Z zero and T. Okay, hopefully I got Okay, let me see whether I can do this, all right? Okay. Right, here we go. Cheers. And present, share screen, Chrome tab, also share audio, share, you guys see that? Let's see whether you can hear it. Yeah, I'll see it, but yeah. Yeah, that's the back. That's the same. I got the same. All right. Well, then I think that's to see you. I mean, yeah, they're having problems setting up the video themselves when they're well, doing it. Sharing his screen. 
That's his screen. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just, but that's just to so we can see you. There okay. you go. It's, okay. You've got it. My pleasure it's, to introduce the next speaker, who's Albrecht Gieser, who's going to talk about the Samyak effect disproves Einstein's relativity. Okay, over to you, Albrecht. Yeah, hello and greetings. Greetings, hello, you all. Yeah. Well, about the Samyak effect. And the Sanyak effect is presently an important one to my feeling. And why is this Sanyak experiment important? Um, this, this experiment answers the question of the constancy of the speed of light in an arbitrary frame of reverence. And so it decides between the relativity of Einstein and uh, the relativity according to Lorentz. <coughs> So we have to talk, I will to talk a little bit first about this relativity question. Uh, we have two ways of relativity. Uh, the one of Einstein, which is based on principles. <clears throat> and the principle of relativity is the following. The laws of physics are the same in every inertial frame. That is Einstein. And he has based his relativity on this. We will see it later a bit more. Uh, the second way is of Lorentz, and Lorentz uh, has based relativity on known physical processes. Uh, these are two processes in, in general, are in principle for special relativity. Temporal processes slow down at motion, and fields contract at motion. Uh, Lorentz way gives the same results as Einstein. But the mathematics is dramatically simpler. Also, imagination is much simpler with Lorentz than with Einstein. And uh, this way resolves, in addition, unresolved problems uh, like the dark matter and dark energy problem, also inflation and things like that. Uh, OK, we start with uh, special relativity as three points, contraction, dilation, the constant, constant speed of light, constancy of the speed of light. And piece by piece, the contraction. Einstein has defined that uh, space must contract so as to fulfill the relativity principle, which was his guiding way. For Lorentz, it's a contraction of fields. And that is a, a physical fact known from the Maxwell theory found by Heaviside. And so it is a physical fact. And here's the uh, equations here, you know that it's found again in the Lorentz transformation later. And Lorentz was able to fully explain the Michelson Morley experiment, since the Michelson Morley apparatus contracts also at motion, which explains the not fully explains the null result of the experiment. So dilation of time, again, Einstein has to define the dilation of time so as to fulfill the relativity principle. For Lorentz, uh, this is not about time, but more physical about oscillations. And uh, there are uh, internal pro uh, oscillations uh, going on with speed of light in a particle. That was a, physically, uh, a physical fact which was suspected around the year 1900, was a bit speculative at that time and later confirmed 1930 for Dirac and Schrödinger. So if you, uh, precisely speaking, it's done for the electron, but there's no reason that other fermions uh, do it in a different way. And this dilation propagates to all oscillations and also in our macro world. You can see it here as a principle here, if you have a Dirac a light clock and you move it and you see the period, the time of a period is extended and this uh, causes this equation, which we could know. And uh, if we assume a particle model, which I assume with uh, subparticles uh, orbiting at speed of light, uh, it's also the same cause for dilation. So there are, uh, now back to Sanyak. There are two opinions about the Sanyak experiment. The one say the Sanyak experiment conforms to Einstein, and this was frequently uh, investigated and published, and most with this result. And all the Sanyak experiment conflicts with Einstein. Who is right? You one can say both are right in, in a different way or for a different perspective. Um, this uh, positive opinion is correct for an observer at rest 
who tricks the setup of the from the outside the um, uh, Sanyak setup looks from the, from from above to the thing and looks what happens there. That is all in uh, confirmation uh, conforms to Einstein. And the other one, it is uh, this, uh, that it not fits is correct for an observer who moves with the system, which is particularly actual for navigation systems. I had to do with such navigation systems, and so I was brought uh, to uh, use this again as an argument. Uh, pro or contra the conformity to Einstein. This is the Sanyak in a simple way, this Sanyak uh, setup. We have a light source here and the light goes through a beam splitter. One part goes straight to a mirror and then to a mirror again, to a mirror again, and then again straight to a detector. And the other one is reflected here, goes this way, mirror, mirror, mirror and back also and comes to the detector or of course only a part of it but there comes something and here we can have um, interference uh, relation and this interference is in a stable situation uh, a constant picture so now the, that's the interesting thing if we rotate the whole apparatus then it's easily to say easy to say that now the way here going with the rotation is a longer one so it needs the uh, signal needs more time to arrive here at the detector. And the other one, opposite to the motion, uh, needs a curve, shorter, shorter time, and comes here on. And so this uh, uh, rotation is indicated, indicated by a change of this um, interference picture here. Okay. And in this view, if you look into it in this way, it is no problem with Einstein because every motion here, every part uh, conforms with Einstein. That is a view from an observer at rest. So, and this is used, for instance, here, what I've seen as a technical uh, realization. Here, it's not mirrors, but we use a fiber optic here and use several winds the more the precise is this whole thing. And it happens, it's going on the same here. The light beam goes through the beam uh, divider, switch up divider this way and arrives here to the detector. And the other one is reflected here, also goes the other way around and also ends up with the detector. And that is again, very sensitive to a rotation of the whole apparatus and can be used to measure or to detect rotations, which is very essential for navigation systems. We had earlier, you know, perhaps uh, mechanical gyroscope platforms used in planes and ships. They are very heavy, very expensive, very uh, need very much maintenance and, uh, and so on. This is a very simple device. You can see this is, a, for instance, uh, such a box you can buy, which has it in it. And the precision is, uh, I think, great. Uh, it can have one third of a degree deviation or precision uh, of a day. So if it's more than one, one tenth of a degree per day, this will be detected by such a device. Okay. Yeah, and my statement, this navigation function only works because Einstein is wrong. And I want to show you that. So here we have now one of the wines, yeah, it's good enough to explain it. It's not so precise, but you can see we in principle how it works. There's again, again, a light source which feeds in light. Uh, it can be a wave again, but we can also take a pulse, which is more practical because then we can measure with a clock how much uh, time such a pulse needs. So this light pulse goes, what, what does my also do here goes this way I've colored it green to distinguish it from the other one here around and at the same time of course this is the other going the other way by also by a beam splitter and they meet here and if they are waves they make a interference sec section or we can do it in the other way that we take pulses and can measure the time which is needed here and um, here this is equation uh, the time right hand and left hand is the same and the speed of this uh, pulse is the circ circumference divided by uh, the time which is measured. 
Now, if it's now rotated the whole thing, then the meeting point uh, during such a uh, way, one circuit goes here to this side. So one uh, way again is longer for a pulse and for the other pulse, it is shorter for the green pulse, it's shorter that is indicated here. Uh, the one is uh, shorter, that is one which goes opposite to the rotation and the one and next is longer time which can be measured here. And so we measure a speed or you calculate the speed from it. And for the brown circuit or pulse, the speed in the system, in this rotating system is C minus V. V is the speed on the surface of this apparatus. And the speed, the green speed is C plus V also for the observer of the system uh, more than the um, standard speed of light. So we look to add more careful to this whole thing because that is an essential part of this uh, consideration. We take a little um, sector out of it and look further to the sector that is this one. And I've this is only now, now the brown uh, piles uh, that is sufficient to look at one of them. And um, of course, the speed which I've shown on the previous one is uh, the same all over this whole circuit because that is given by, by symmetry. So, and this now moves into this direction on a circuit. And um, for uh, observer, that should be observer, which moves with the whole thing here, uh, this rotation of motion. Uh, for him, if he measures speed of the pulse, it is C, speed of light minus V, which is the speed of this thing. Okay. Now, um, it is not the speed of light. Uh, so make one, one could say in, co in conflict with Einstein, but uh, special relativity is not uh, for curved, uh, for rotational motion or for curved paths. So it's not by itself, this is not a real information about it. But to have get this, we take here a little straight piece of such uh, um, yeah, um, fiber optic, optical piece. And here the pulse moves also to this direction and it, the whole thing here, the whole piece of uh, fiber moves uh, in the same direction tangentially with the same speed. And if we now measure the speed of this signal here, we get, of course, uh, can we expect the speed of light, the nominal speed of light. Okay, now we have here different cases with different measurements. Yeah, but we can now consider the following. We have here this difference and we have this number here, this value here, and this difference between both is V, is independent of the radius here of this uh, circuit of this loop. Hmm? So we can increase this radius and this will not change the difference. We can increase this as, mu as much as we want and can. It, the difference always is V. So now we can uh, increase the radius until we, it reaches infinity. And if it reaches infinity, then these two sections here and here become physically identical. But still we have the case that here we have C minus V and here C. So, and then we have a conflict because in that case where they are fully, when they are physically identical, they should have the same value. Who is right now? Which one is right now? This is right because correct, because it is a direct measurement with one clock at the end. And why is this different? And that is now the interesting case. It is different. We have to use two clocks here to measure this. Uh, one way for a one way piece, we always need two clocks. And these clocks, of course, has have to be synchronized. And the problem is how are they synchronized? So, Again, the difference between both measurements is independent of the radius. And we have here made the transition from the Sanyak uh, case, which is the curve, to the Einstein case where it is straight. Yeah. Here, now, Einstein synchronization, and that is a problem. This is a um, facsimile of his famous paper of 1905, where he, uh, he explains in German what. Uh, how synchronization is done. I have taken it out here again in German. 
and here I have the okay, translation to English. Okay, and I translate to synchronization to this topic, but it is not possible without further definition to compare an, an event in A, one position, and an event in B, the other position. We have uh, we have defined so far only an A time for the event in A and a B time for the event in B, but no time common for A and B. The latter time for both can be defined by stating by definition that the time which the time needs, light needs to get from A to B is the same as the time which it needs to get from B to A. Okay. And we assume, says Einstein, that this definition of synchronism is possible in a contradiction-free way. And here we have to contradict Einstein. It is a contradiction here in the case of Sanyak. Again, what Einstein does, just to make it clear, we have two clocks which have to be synchronized. The whole thing is moving. And we send a signal from A to B and signal from B to A. And Einstein says, uh, we rely on the fact that T1 and T2 are both the same. So and I, this I, assumption of Einstein is only correct if C is constant in any moving system. And that now is circular reasoning. If you define, if you synchronize two clocks in this way, then you can measure any speed of light and you will always get the same value. It's a circular reasoning. Yeah. So if cl clocks are synchronized in this way, the speed result must always be speed of light, the nominal. So and that says means what the result is, the conclusion is the constancy of C is not a property of nature, but it's a property of Einstein synchronization. I hope it, this is understandable. This is the essential result of this uh, view on the Sanyak experiment. So we have the other case, which we know that is the two-way measurement. Uh, light signal is sent to a mirror and comes back. And if and we measure uh, the nominal speed of light. And if this is moved, we measure the same speed of light. But we know if this is moved, the clock will run with a different speed. And also these uh, distance, uh, the mirror will, by contraction, move closer to these uh, points here of um, uh, the sending and receiving point. And that is, of course, given, and that is given, as I said, by already by the Maxwell uh, model. So here's the other point. Top point, two points. The clock runs more slowly in motion at the distance d contracts in motion according also according to already according to Maxwell. And this also covers the Michael Mori experiment because that is what essentially goes on by the Michael Mori experiment. Okay, so with this result of Sanyak, the Lorentz version of relativity is the only surviving one. And this has tremendous consequences. We do not need any four dimensional space time in special relativity. We do not need curved four dimensional space time in general relativity. Mm -hmm. We can use Euclidean geometry, and that is. An, uh, dramatically easier mathematics. So because, why, why did Einstein do it this way? To show it in a simple way, he had to solve this equation C plus some speed V is against C for any V. And this is not possible by, uh, by Euclidean geometry. So Einstein had to invent a new geometry that was based on what he has invented to solve this problem. And for general, for special relativity, this is the Minkowski metric. And for general relativity, the Riemannian geometry. Um, this space time is a cause, as we know, if we have learned it for many problems and difficult for the difficult understanding of Einstein's theory. And when we do it with Lorentz, we can add it in the normal way, Euclidean way. Of course, of course, now we have to take into account that these single speeds are normally measured in a different frame than the result of the sum. And we have then, of course, uh, made a transformation to the uh, frame of the observer. And then we get as a result, again, as a nominal result, the speed of light. But that is a consequence of this necessary 
trans uh, for uh, what is this tra um, yeah transformation. So the consequence of Euclidean geometry. Um, the, again, what is the relativity of Lorentz and the solution of Lorentz? It is based on a variable speed of light, which has a classical summation, and an absolute system, which is sometimes called ether, but that's a bad word because we associate ether with something which is no more physical. Uh, but uh, the whole thing is based on physical phenomena. That is a special thing of Lorentz. So, and we also can go to a general relativity. Uh, the Lorentzian, there's also a Lorentzian way of general relativity. And well, it is very simple. It needs the following ele elements only. It needs the C oscillation with C in elementary particles, which we have already used for special relativity. And it needs the reduction of speed of light in a gravitational field. And this is something which was almost found also by Einstein. He has uh, written a paper 90, uh, in the year 1911, where he have taken this phenomenon to draw uh, conclusions out of it, but he made in his calculation an error. He had an error, and so he didn't continue. He should have continued, then he would have, I think, ended at the same thing as I'm show, showing it to you, here to you. So now we have here with general relativity a much simpler mathematics. Do not need curved space time. And uh, I will show you this at, a, at an example. And this is the deduction of the Schwarzschild solution. Uh, I, I think you know the Schwarzschild solution, but I can say it again. Einstein's field equations are very complicated. And Schwarzschild has uh, built a subset or a reduction of it for the case of a spherical, a spherically uh, symmetric uh, field, like around the sun. And then anything becomes uh, much easier, much simpler. And um, this, is, this is the case which is often happens and is often the case in questions of astronomy. And so it's helpful. OK, here is the deduction of Schwarzschild solution. According to Einstein, these are more than 80 equations. I've copied them from a textbook about general relativity. Uh, with our text, just equations one after the other. And to understand these equations, we have to understand Riemannian geometry of the four-dimensional curve spacetime. And here, Einstein's field equations, which is also quite complicated. Not, not every physicist is able, able to do it, but if one does it uh, and does it correctly, then it ends up with this version, for instance, of the Schwarzschild solution. That is with Einstein. And now I show you how it works with Lorentz. We start here with the uh, part of the Lorentz transformation, which describes the time dilation, a special way to write it down. And we could have we could deduce it here again, but it's so simple that I take it here as it is. And we make a little transformation. We split it up to polar coordinates because it is needed later. And this is still without gravity. That is in a gravity field uh, situation, gravity free situation. Now we switch on gravity and we get these changes. Uh, the speed of light changes uh, is reduced in a gravitational field in different ways. It will be different for radial motion and for tangential motion. And because this is different, all the fields which are somehow described by uh, exchange particles which move at the speed of light, and we get a contraction in the radial direction. Uh, that is just a consequence of these two facts. Okay. And this is inserted here now, piece by piece. And we get these uh, changes in these uh, parts here. Okay. Was well, not so difficult. We have only to fill it in here. And now we reorder it. And what, get, what do we get here? The Schwarzschild solution. And look how simple it was. You can do it at school. The other thing you cannot do in school. To compare it again to Einstein, this is Einstein, uh, according to Einstein. I'm sometimes, uh, if I discuss with other physicists what is better, Einstein or Lorentz, uh, professors normally tell me Einstein is so much better because it is so much simpler than Lorentz. Yeah. This is the simplicity as a simple way 
of Einstein, and this is the complicated way of Lorentz. Um, you can make yourself <laughs> an opinion what you think, what is better, what is the correct version. Okay. Um, can we do say again to this? Oh. No. Okay. There are many other things. Uh, I have investigated um, other uh, situations of general relativity, and I also found one can do them with Lorentz, and it's simpler and it has the same design. Okay, we may come back to this again. Okay, so what is our lesson? What is the conclusion from this uh, things which I've shown you? Einstein's assumption of a constant speed of light in any brain is a historical error. He does it with his way of synchronization, what could say. And that is uh, circular reasoning. Einstein's assumption of the ab absolute absence of an absolute last frame is also historical. Uh, error which both hang together, uh, logically are connected. The corresponding change towards the Lorentz, Lorentzian relativity is a return to physics. It facilitates the mathematics used in a much to a much simpler one, and it solves open problems like dark energy, dark matter, inflation, and so on. So, here another summary from Christoph, philosopher Hans Reichenbach, German philosopher. He has cooperated several times with Einstein and has written many, some books about relativity. And he has said, made the following analogy. He said, we can see Einstein's relativity analog to the Ptolemaic system and Lorentz's relativity analog to the Copernican system. And that is also what I feel. I think this is a good description of the situation. So in general, the change towards, is another summary, the change towards the relativity according to Lorentz is a return to physics. It simplifies the mathematics towards a much simpler one while keeping the least core uh, results according to Einstein and solves open problems as I've seen already. So now a question to you who are listening to my talk. If somebody of you in the audience doubts this fact, and this fact is the fact that Einstein and Lorenz, Lorenz has the same really uh, results than Einstein. Hello, finish it now. The process can you close the talk? And only Hello. The process via Einstein. And I think I can answer to it. And I'm quite confident that I can show you that it really works. Can you stop the talk now? Okay. All right. That was you good with that video. And I thought a bit loses me a bit. I understood the what you were saying about the special relativity. Uh, so don't ask me about the general relativity. With general relativity, relativity just gets a lot more complicated. But I understood his point that he was making about the Sanak experiment in regards to uh, special relativity. Uh, what you got with the Sanak exper experiment is you don't have the speed of light as C. It is it's not as constant, but uh, when you read Einstein's paper on special relativity, it's not really clear what it's supposed to do with motion when it's in a circle. When the paper of 1905 is treating light going in a straight line. So it's I, I i look upon that as relativity uh, being uh, vague ambiguous as to how it's supposed to deal with the sanak experiment and another point that i found very interesting is when he pointed out that Einstein in 1911 had a paper which was dealing with variable light speed and really that's a interpretation of that paper but in that paper, he, he seemed to be considering a variable light speed. And Einstein made a mistake when he was dealing with that and he abandoned that approach to relativity. But the person you might be familiar with, with is Utzinger. Utzinger is carrying on that sort of line of research or picking up on Einstein's idea of variable light speed. So it all sort of ties in that 
even when you say Einstein is wrong, that Einstein, you go back to his papers and he, and he has considered certain ideas. So if you say well, Einstein is wrong for having constant light speed, well, he actually considered a variable light speed as well. So, so he, you can't win with Einstein. He sort of like tr starts trying all possibilities. And so that's, that is my position upon it. Special relativity, I think, is vague as to how, how it deals with uh, the Sanak experiment. But uh, Dr. Gleese is interpreting it in such a way that uh, Einstein's relativity must be wrong. And you should really be going with the Lorentz version of how to deal with the Lorentz transformations, Lorentz theory, and the way it deals with Lorentz transformations. So I want to open that up to uh, discussion. What do other people think? Thank you. Yes. Uh, so uh, Jim Marson says uh, the Sanak effect was observed eight years after Einstein's 1905 paper proposing special relativity. Did Einstein ever explicitly address the Sanak effect? Uh, um, well, I've been reading these things on relativity and Einstein didn't become famous until 1919. And when Einstein was writing his papers between 1905 and 1919, he seems to have been mostly ignored by academia. It was only when he became famous, that suddenly the academia started to pay a bit of attention to him. And uh, various other people have dealt with relativity in that period between 1905 and 1919, because you've got people like Minkowski, who came up with the idea of space time, and there was other people like Franz or something so there were there were a small number of people working on relativity, which I think were mostly Einstein's friends. And so if Einstein hadn't dealt with the Sanak effect, then probably one of his friends would had done. But it is still when when it comes to teaching Einstein's relativity in the textbooks and that, it all sort of is a as far as I'm concerned, a confusing mess when they talk about these things. And what they do is, in some of them, not all of them, they sort of tell you, oh, the Sanak effect is not dealt with by special relativity, and instead it's dealt with by general relativity. So you've got this flip backwards and forwards between different parts of Einstein's relativity. And so that makes, 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 makes all this mess, as far as I'm concerned. So who's the next person? Next comment. Uh, any other comments? Oh, Cornelius, um, what, what, what is, uh, my eyesight's bad. I can't see that. It's too small for me. <laughs> can can somebody come like frankly read it for me? I'm on the laptop and my, my eyes are not. Well, Cornelius asks, if Lorentz does not use curved space time, how does he explain the cause of gravitational effects? Yeah, yeah. With uh, in the in the period uh, of 1905-1919, you seem to, you seem to have Einstein dealing with his approach to relativity, and you had Lorentz who who was working on his theory, and Lorentz theory seems to be picked up by Poincaré, Henry Poincaré, um, and they developed their own approach to theorizing about it and how Poirain Carey uh, connects to what Einstein's talking about, I don't really know because what, one of the big major problems is Einstein doesn't reference where he's getting his ideas from. He's not citing, I, never, I don't think Einstein ever cites Poincaré, so you don't see how these ideas connect together. So what is taught is Einstein's relativity, and you don't get talk, talk, uh, 
what might be an alternative approach to it, which is Poincaré, and that is another big research problem to look into, to to how Poincaré would have dealt with it. So it's, uh, I don't know, is the answer. How, how would Lorentz theory deal with gravity? I don't know, but there is literature on Poincaré's theory, which I've not gone into. Is it? Is that hopefully answers some of that? Next question. Is it? Is it anybody else a question? Well, this is kind of a comment from Jim. Maybe you can comment yeah. on this, which he says, and according to Einstein's second postulate for special relativity, the Sagnac effect shouldn't exist at all. Mm -hmm. Find one way relative motion of the source and receiver as observed in the GPS. Yeah. Uh, well, that might be part of the reason why Dr. Gleese thinks the point uh, thinks the SANAC experiment uh, disproves uh, special relativity. But from my perspective on it, uh, special relativity is vague on how it's supposed to deal with the Sanak experiment and all the literature sort of like from textbooks and that they're just very confusing and conflicting on these things so uh, when things like happen like that happen it just ends up in you try to discuss it with people it sort of ends up with uh, debate or arguments and you can't seem to get uh, agreement so and that, that's what I think is a one of the big problems with Einstein's relativity that it's vague, it's not really very clear on certain issues. And so people have different opinions on how to deal with uh, that sort of thing. It's, it's really a theory should be properly defined. And unfortunately, Einstein's relativity isn't, it's got a lot of uh, gaps in it to where people will try to uh, add different things to it. So what's the next question? Well, we had this other comment from Chicken Little Syndrome. Yeah. Said, so the answer is yes, as far as, you know, does it contradict? So the Sagnet experiment disproves Einstein's version of relativity, but it does not contradict a Lorentz version of relativity. Sagnet does not contradict the Lorentz transformation. So this is where it gets yeah. really confusing, where they say yes, but no, but yes, but no. Hmm. Uh, so, I, th I think I think Dr. Gleeser was uh, admitting about that the Lorentz theory is better than Einstein's, where you've got got uh, the way that Lorentz deals with Lorentz transformations instead of the way Einstein deals with Lorentz transformations. But you can end up arguing with people, and they say, "Well, the mathematics is the same," which is basically the Lorentz transformations, and you sort of like you hit another barrier with that sort of thing. But I think that's what Gleese was saying, that the Lorentz theory deals with the mathematics better. So in his interpretation, Lorentz theory uh, deals with the Sanak experiment, but not the Einstein's version of it. Okay, sorry. Is it next one? Well, here's a question yeah. uh, from Andrew, Andrew Castor. Why is it that radiative processes like Bremsstrung or Beth Block can only be described with special relativity? Well, I, don't, I don't know about those specific things, but when I've looked at uh, Einstein's relativity, it's all like, ah, uh, they're, they're trying, when they do an experiment or whatever, they're trying to impose an interpretation on it as agreeing to Einstein's relativity. And you've got the basic mathematics and they're trying to impose Einstein's interpretation upon that mathematics. And uh, it gets philosophical like, oh, you shouldn't be placing that interpretation upon the mathematics. You should be interpreting from a different uh, theory, which is usually Lorentz theory. So it all ends up just arguing again with where some people take the point of view, oh, you've got the mathematics, which is Lorentz's, Lorentz transformations, 
And so it doesn't matter about the interpretation, but you can't seem to get agreement again on people. Yeah, this seems to be the key point is that uh, the, the Einstein paper, you know, correctly includes basically Lorentz relativity. Yeah. And, you know, Nick pointed out uh, the last session that, you know, the only difference in Einstein's relativity is that he's just saying that uh, you, you can be the preferred frame. Uh, anyone can be the preferred frame yeah. at the same time. But see, if you do the experiments, you know, the math works out perfectly fine, which, yeah. of course, supports special relativity. And, you know, to Andrew's question, you know, these things, uh, you know, to the to the extent that the math works out in special relativity, which uses, of course, the, the Lorentz transformation. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that, that, that can be explained with special relativity, which is just... Yeah which is just Lorenz relativity in wolf's clothing or sheep's clothing. Um, you know, is that really the, the problem here? It, well, uh, well I, I don't really like calling it Lorenz relativity because the relativity principle is, uh, uh, well, there's, there's no preferred frame uh, and there's no ether frame. And in the Lorentz theory, I, I think this, you, you are allowing that sort of thing. You're allowing the ether and the preferred frames. So that was my interpretation of it. So uh, Lorentz theory, theory is not sticking so rigidly to the relativity principle. And it's one of the big areas of the confusion between how Lorentz transformations are dealt with by Lorentz and how they're dealt with by Einstein. It's sort of like imposing the relativity principle upon those transformations, which causes a lot of the problems. So Andrew's got another follow up here. Can any radiative process be described with Lorentz relativity? And, you know, I just like to ask Andrew, can you just give us uh, some examples of radiative processes? Maybe one that we might be able to recognize. We don't quite recognize the REM string or birth block, I guess. But yeah. Perhaps something uh, something a little bit more descriptive. <clears throat> um, we also have some people in our green room. Uh, we have uh, Dennis yeah. and we have James and Ian and uh, Harry. Uh, yeah. If you'd like to bring up uh, one of these folks Okay, bring them on. Bring them on. Bring I'd them like on. to know if anybody agrees with uh, Dr. Gleese, uh, what well, he's saying I, about I, relativity. Maybe he wants to uh, yeah. add some comments. Yeah. Maybe I'll get my screen bigger here. Uh, uh, th thank you, yes. Um, I, I've so much to say on this that I, I, I don't want to um, yeah. take, take, take too much time. Uh, but basically, in answer to your question, um, Roger, yeah. I, I I actually go further than Dr. Geese. Um, I, mm. I do agree with him, actually, that, that um, I'll put my cards on the table now, um, that uh, the Sanyak effect does contradict uh, the special theory of relativity. Yes, on the yeah. face of it, it does. But I go further. I, I, I say that Lorentzian, whether you call relativity or Lorentzian, kinematics whatever you want to call it um mm -hmm. save save the problem because uh, you you still get um uh, an, an effect of constant c uh from from the disc you know observed by an observer moving with the disc it, it, it owing to different circumstances admittedly mm -hmm. these are physical but you still get that and and this is what the um uh what what the 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 uh, experiment disproves now there were some other experiments done to to show that the light was actually moving in a, a fixed, let us call it an ether frame, <clears throat> which was um, entrained by the Earth. Uh, for example, there were experiments done by uh, Dufour and Prunier in the 1930s in Paris, which um, intermediate between uh, the, the the source of light and the detector um, 
aim, 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 aim the light at uh, fixed mirrors in the laboratory, maybe on the ceiling or on the walls, and then yeah. back, and so on. And they, they did a number of experiments of that nature, and they, they found that there was no difference in the fringe shift. The effect was still the same. So uh, now, w w when you start talking about introducing general relativity and all that sort of thing, well... Newtonian dynamics explains everything. The Galilean transformations explain everything. And when mm -hmm. people, it, for example, Wikipedia does this, um, w w when they say, oh, you, you can't even uh, apply special relativity because it's a non-inertial non frame. Well, th 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 that seems very, very strange when um, you say that the Galilean transformations work in analyzing the rotational frame of the same experiment. Uh, but, but the the, rent, uh, transfer, the the Einsteinian system doesn't work. So, uh, so how 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 does the um, Galilean transformation break down in the uh, simple case, in the uh, inertial case where objects are moving, you know, at, at, at constant velocity in a straight line, and yet uh, it works very well in the case of rotation. So basically, uh -huh. there's a lot more that can be said, but I, I'm using the principle of um, Occam's razor. You know, a simple explanation of yeah. what can be obtained using the Galilean transformations and Newtonian mechanics. And unfortunately, I, I'm looking here um, at a list of something like 21 explanations. A bit like we've talked, Roger, about the twin paradox and all the many uh -huh. explanations which have tried to uh, yeah. offer to, to explain the paradox. Well, um, uh, in 1993, a, a paper by Hasselbach and Niklas gave all these explanations as to the uh, anomaly, uh, as to why uh, it, it doesn't appear to uh, conform to special relativity. Optical analogy, general relativity considerations, special relativity analysis, a WKB approximation, I'm not sure that, the Doppler effect of moving media in an inertial frame, a classical kinematic derivation, dynamical analysis, etc. It goes on and on and on. And they're, they're trying to um, to save uh, save the situation. Uh, and so, so I'd say that using Lorentz um, relativity, if I may use the term, is trying to save the situation. And using general relativity is trying to save the situation. I do agree with you that Dr. Geese has indicated how... Um, Lorentzian considerations do simplify the mathematics, but I don't think they do anymore. I think this is incomplete. I'm putting my cards on the table, as I say. This is a complete contradiction to special relativity, and in itself should actually uh, indicate to us that that SRT, yeah. as, as currently put forward, is an incorrect theory. Yeah. I, 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 think, I think you could say I, one of the arguments you get is the uh, special, with I, well, Einstein's relativity has not been properly understood by academia and it's been uh, misunderstood, mis misinterpreted. So that's another problem with it. That we, can I go back to my point of view, when, you, when you're reading Einstein, what he's saying, he's not going into sufficient detail to explain things. And so it's blanks in there. And then so other people have tried to uh, clarify those blank bits and then when they do that there's people keep coming up with different things like as you point out about the twin paradox when you ask the academia about the twin paradox you can ask a dozen different academics and they will give you a different solution to the twin paradox so you've got 12 different solutions you've got no definitive solution out there for that because oh. relativity is vague it's been like right the, People have been trying to add different things to it as explanations. So they've all been branching off in different directions. Perhaps I could mention just one more thing before I leave it. Yeah. Um, he, he, he mentioned um, that when the radius of the disk uh, increases and approaches infinity, you get the straight mm -hmm. line situation. Yeah. So that, that's right. Well, well. So one of the ad hoc explanations is, oh, you cannot even speak about this because it's a non-inertial frame. It's not straight line motion. and It wouldn't work. Well, mm -hmm. the, the, the philosophical argument against that, if it hasn't been accepted by the mainstream, has been demolished by a recent experiment, a fairly recent experiment, by mm -hmm. um, a gentleman by the name of Rudrong Rud Rud Wang, 
where he introduced um, these optical uh, fiber conveyors. They're, they're actually uh, very, very long systems, a bit like um, uh, the, the track uh, around uh, the wheels of a tank. You know, so he's he has optical fibers working in these directions, and only at the very end do you have the, uh, the 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 lasers, if you like, coming back to their point of origin, just just by cupping. But the main area is is uh, long, long, uh, straight line longitudinal motion, and you get the Sanyak effect uh, exactly the same way as you do with this rotation. So yeah. I, I think that sort of takes the. Uh, the base away from uh, from that, that ad hoc explanation. Okay, yeah, yeah. The, the, when they switch over between oh uh, inertial frame to non inertial frame, and then they start saying, "Well, special relativity only deals with an inertial frame, and you have to go to general relativity, non inertial frame." Well, s some people they 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 look at special relativity and want to modify it to deal with non inertial frames. And so, once again, you've got people going off in different directions. And so they're not they're not given a single coherent explanation. It's just all over the place. Yeah, I, I've yeah. explained it actually. I think in, in one of my papers, yeah. as, um, I use the term. Uh, it requires very uh, special mental juggling to mm, yeah. um, accept SRT while whilst accepting the results of the. Um, Sanyak experiment. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's that's that seems to be what they do. They do mental jack. The pe people who believe in relativity do mental juggling. They've got the sort of basic vague outline, and then if you there's something which doesn't quite fit in that, then they've got some mental juggling to try to come up with a different add-on sort of thing. But all the add-ons they give are not the same. It's, it's Einstein never wrote a definitive theory. It was sort of like it was an incomplete theory, and he did he, did, he didn't combine gravity and electromagnetism to find, give his unified theory. So it was just an incomplete theory, and with an incomplete theory, it's people going off in different directions, just making up their different add-ons. And that's what's making it incoherent. At least with some, at least something like Newton, he had a book, he wrote his book, and 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 he had the supplement book to explain the things he didn't know. Uh, so you had it definitively what he was thinking. But with Einstein, he sort of like his thinking sort of like evolved over the years. He wrote papers. 1905 onwards into the 1940s and so forth and sort of like he was changing his mind all the time and so so that's his theory it's a continual process of adding things on and changing things and so his theory is not something solid like saying what newton had you've got well here's his book that's that's newton's theory but with einstein it's all sort of, it's fluid it, Changes. It's, it's, a, it's a collection of books where it's the or a collection of papers. Sorry, where they where they're all saying different things when he's changed his mind. So it's a mess. I, I, by the way, I, I might recommend. Um, I'm just looking at the number chapter uh, chapter three: time and motion. Uh, Al Kelly's book, uh, Questioning mm -hmm. Einstein's Relativity Theories, uh, Challenging Modern Physics. Yeah. Uh, he goes into all these things in, in great detail, actually, and uh, the all the work that's been done in the Sanyak effect, including some of the work I mentioned, and um, a, a very detailed um, summary of, of all an analysis of all the results by, by Post in, in 1997. So, yeah. Um, They're good. Yeah. So, so, so that that's a reference, anyway. Yeah. So uh, the whole thing is just, just block, explodes with too many things to investigate in the end to research. But, but by the way, it might be worth Roger just questioning people uh, as to how many 
had heard of the Sanyak effect from their undergraduate um, work. I just see a, te- a, a message here from Andrew, it has to mm. just about undergraduate work. But um, for my part, I had never heard of it. it. It wasn't in any of the textbooks and it wasn't in any of my undergraduate lectures. Wow. I'd never heard of it until uh, I started yeah. studying the subject myself many, many years later. Yeah. And I'm, well, I'm, I'm wondering, is that a conspiracy? I mean, no, no, are they afraid no. to mention it? Now, obviously, if you go into Wikipedia, you'll have a full article on it. Yeah. But I have to say, they do engage in what I would consider, and you all agree, I think, mental juggling to try to save mm-hmm. relativity. But, you know, it's, it's not censored. But uh, it was never taught to us in, um, in undergraduate physics. I, th- I think they tried to deal with the more simpler experiments, and the main one is the Michelson-Morley experiment. I think that's more simpler to deal with. And sort of my research into the education system is they like to dumb things down to the students, and so they don't they don't want to get into things that are too complicated. But as Jim Morrison explains there in one of his comments earlier, <clears throat> the Michelson-Morley is an experiment in second. Yeah. V over C, whereas this mm. is an experiment in first order V over C. Now, mm-hmm. I, I, I think actually the, the the results for first order V over C uh, are actually simpler, and certainly they're of a greater magnitude. The, the, you know, it, it shows up the, the effect. I mean, the, mm. this disk is only spinning at a number of revolutions per second, and um, you can actually find these results. Whereas in for linear motion, you're, you're saying, well, we have to take uh, the Earth traveling at 30 kilometers per second, and we still don't see a very big um, yeah. result. Yeah. So I, 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 well, I don't well, have a sufficient explanation. It's yeah. complicated. It's, it's actually very simple if you look yeah. at it in the right way. I, I well, would well, anyway. Go back to my days when they were first doing it. You, you do Newtonian physics before you go on to relativity and physics. And when you turn your physics, well, when it's straight line motion, that's quite easy to understand. But when it's circular motion, in, even in the Newtonian physics, it gets a bit difficult to understand because you've got uh, things like torque and that sort of thing. So even so, that might be reason why they want to ignore that as much as possible in when they teach relativity. They want to do something simpler than with. Uh, circular motion well i that may be a factor but i think maybe more fundamentally uh, they do know that this is claimed to contradict uh, special relativity and you know it's a bit like theology you're you're, you're looking at a particular type of doctrine and you, you yeah. don't want to introduce maybe something which contradicts that well here they're introducing the doctrine of modern yeah. physics that everything was saved in post-1900 and so on and so forth and they don't want to sow any doubts in them um, yeah well, in i think right. with, with, with the sanac i think they, they still say the people who believe in relativity still say that that, that agrees with einstein but and so if you're going to teach a class on relativity mm-hmm. it, you didn't want to go into the complications of why they think it still agrees with einstein so and because it might might show that they're that there's flawed thinking involved in that. So, because when you start looking at about its circular motion, as I said, in tr- context of Newton- Newtonian physics, it starts getting complicated. And circular motion within relativity might start getting too complicated. And I say, oh, and then it might be start, oh, some bright spark in the class might point out to teach you that, that sit, the speed of light C is not constant anymore. And that might really upset the tutor. Well, well that's the going. point. I mean, one doesn't have to introduce yeah. inertial forces, centrifugal forces, or Coriolis yeah. forces, or Euler forces. I mean, one just does a simple geometrical anal- analysis, which Geese, I think, hinted at, you know, yeah. where, where you have this, the sum of the uh, distances and dis- differences of distances, depending upon whether you're on the disk or outside the disk. If you're on the disk, the speed varies. If you're outside the disk, the um, yeah. distance varies. Um, but, and, and the only reason you're using a circular disk is, is, is it's a way of bringing back the, 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 the uh, rays uh, back to the detector. I mean, in, in the um, <coughs> Michelson-Morley, well, it's reflected against the mirror, but you have to c- compare the um, longitudinal uh, tra- uh, traverse with the transverse one. So, so it's a quite a different system. And as I say, it turns out to be 
uh, v squared over c squared. So the effects mm -hmm. are very, very small. But this gives you relatively large effects. As I say, for a, spin, a simple spinning disk, um, you, you, you can find the difference in the speed of light, I would maintain, uh, which is, you know, obviously very, very much greater than that <clears throat> by the use of spinning disk. And then, of yeah. course, you have this, um, <clears throat> optical fiber conveyors, which are effectively longitudinal elements. They're, they're, they're not circular. And yet we mm -hmm. don't hear anything about those. I, I suppose if you introduced them to undergraduate text, you would, um, you'd, well, the academics would probably say you'd confuse the undergraduates. Well, yeah. perhaps more correctly, you would make them question the whole basis of what they're being taught, yeah. which might be a bit embarrassing. No, um, also, I should have put should have pointed out there's the elementary elementary level and the more advanced level of graduate undergraduate. So, when when the uh, lecturers sort of like want to dumb it down, if the students uh, are not supposed to be getting the more complicated version, more, they're more complicated versions of teaching. It's, if they think you've got a high class of highly intelligent students who would teach a higher level of it but sort of the when when they did teach uh, relativity in the elementary form to people they think a bit dumber rather than the elite uh, they do start saying things which <coughs> which which are contradicted when they're talking to more advanced well they think of more advanced cleverer students and that's that's another area why things get so conflicting with one group of people saying one thing and the other group saying something else and sort of like with with say one of the things they say to stu students when it's a very simplified version is no uh, special relativity only deals with inertial frames and if you want to go non-inertial you use general relativity but sort of like if you went to a higher level more advanced level mm -hmm. Then they would be saying, "Yeah, you could adapt special relativity to deal with non-inertial frames." And so this is the same one thing one moment and say something else the next. It's it's sort of like just a conf conflicting mess. Well, it, it's the... interesting that the the effect actually was first observed <clears throat> um, yeah. before Sanyak <clears throat> by a, a German postgraduate mm -hmm. student by the name of Harris, mm -hmm. um, and um, in 1911. He, he was killed in the First World War, so we never got any further <sighs> from that. But um, <clears throat> but one wonders if one could be maybe a little cynical about the matter, that, that if one went to um, an established university with a proposal to look at um, the, the Sanyak effect in, in the light of, of um, you know, New Galilean or Newtonian analysis, yeah. So, in other words, that you <clears throat> you weren't certain at the first in, in the first instance going to bring in things like general relativity, and you were <clears throat> endeavouring perhaps to uh, establish what at first sight seemed to be the case that um, <clears throat> this could not be maintained using modern theories of relativity, whether it will be accepted. I mean, I've certainly never come across any um, postgraduate work in this area. I've had to go to you know some advanced researchers. I, I've mentioned mm. some already. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so, so I'm wondering if if we'd accept it in, in in a modern university. So that's all been done. Just look at Wikipedia. That 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 tells you the, the results. And yeah. <clears throat> the, the, the the problem is is the <clears throat> as a physics student, you got to go through the undergraduate, the uh, ordinary degree, <clears throat> uh, and then it's uh, if you pass that, you might do a master's degree, and they may, then might be on to be a PhD. It all sort of becomes a specialized subject, and, and when you when you're doing that, you you're moving up up the ladder and sort of like deciding what you may have been taught at the lower level wasn't correct. But then you're having the problem of trying to get uh, the research council to fund your research, so uh, it's difficult to, I think, difficult to. Uh, give reasons to them for why you, your research should be funded. It's a similar I, I, I don't want to um, hog the yeah. conversation. I may come yeah. back with your permission, but there may be some others in the green room who, who might want mm -hmm. to. Uh, uh, Roger. <clears throat> Hi, uh, Dennis has got his hand up, so Dennis I, wants I can to bring me down. I could bring my, I'll bring myself down. Yeah, bring Dennis up. Yeah. Hi, Dennis. Okay. 
Tennis, bring yourself up. Oh, you got a book there. So, can you bring yourself up? So, is it? Oh, well, I don't think Dennis can bring himself up. Uh, only administrators can. Oh, there we go. I, I, in this book, oh, I the grip of the distant universe uh, by uh, T. D. Neil Grana, who uh, uh, David uh, Bauer uh, talked on uh, the other recently. Uh, it points out that the Dayton Miller experiments which were uh, more particular than the uh, Michelson-Morley. Yeah. Uh, they uh, showed that if you use sidereal time to plot the uh, uh, data as opposed to uh, ordinary time, where yeah. sidereal time is time with respect to the fixed stars, mm -hmm. not with respect to rotating around the sun, mm -hmm. you do uh, get a non-null result for uh, the uh, generalized michelson worley experiment. In other words, it's not true that there's uh, uh, there's no ether. There is an ether. Yeah. And, uh, but the effect, the, the effect is smaller than one would think. And so it probably is that the Earth entrains the ether a little bit. And uh, so you're only, that's why you pick up such a small value, uh, but not a zero value, is because uh, of the fact that the Earth entrains the ether. Now, the Dayton Miller experiments were done at high altitude, where you would think that the entrainment would be less and mm -hmm. go to zero as the altitude went to infinity. Yeah. So, uh, this idea that uh, Dr. Geese presented that the Michelson Morley experiment showed that there's no ether, basically, he didn't put it quite that way, but that's what yeah. it amounts to, is wrong. Yeah. I think, I don't know, I can't remember what he said. I, I, with the, with the uh, Lorentz theory, you are accepting there is an ether. Lorentz does accept there's an ether, from my point of view on it. I can't remember what he said about that. Yes, Lorentz so, uh, believes in the in the Lorentzian ether. Yeah, and, and Einstein became famous because he said, "No, there is no ether." Yeah, Look at the Michelson Morley experiment, and that's what people wanted to hear at the time. Yeah, they uh, that's what the ether. Uh, it it was too uh, almost religious. Uh, yeah, the, go ahead. Einstein sort of like rejected the ether in 1905 where you can interpret it that way most people do and then in the 1920s he seemed to be saying there was an ether he gave a talk on the ether he lectured on the ether and what i heard there was lorenz was in the audience when he was given that talk i'm not sure that's right but that's what i've been hearing and so it was sounding like uh, einstein was agreeing with the lorenz's version of how to interpret the theory but but in academia, they seem to keep staying with what Einstein said in 1905, and they don't seem to want to go with Einstein when he changed his mind about things. Well, they they don't want to hear it, but yeah. not for physical reasons, as far as physics is concerned. They mm -hmm. don't want to hear it because it's too religious. Uh, if yeah. there's an ether, then, uh, you know, that's much more of a religious idea that it's, yeah. it's all relative, everything's relative, you know. Mm. And so uh, they, they accepted his earlier interpretation of the null result in, in the Michelson-Morley experiment because that's what they wanted to hear. And it wasn't because they wanted to hear it so much from the viewpoint of physics yeah. as uh, religion it was the real thing. They were beginning yeah. to worship the... Uh, uh, what Paul Dirac, I believe, called the religion of mathematical beauty. Yeah. It might, it might be tied into when Einstein said, God does not play dice with the universe. And uh, the board, Niels Bohr disagreed with him when he was doing quantum mechanics. And so the mainstream wanted to go with the idea that there was randomness and that everything was random and there was no creative force at work 
And so yeah. Einstein, Einstein seemed to be going with the idea there was a creative force behind the universe and the mainstream didn't like it. Yeah. I didn't like that. So that, that might be part of why they've yeah. just, mainstream wanted to discard the ether. They wanted to uh, get rid of God. Yeah. With God, God is even in Newton, you kind of like you've got the clockmaker, the universe where it's clockwork. Yeah. And so God is the person with the entity that created the clock working universe. Yeah. So they wanted, they seem to be wanting to go away from that point of view. Yeah, they, they didn't they, like they, that at all. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. I didn't get that bit. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, so it seemed to be happening with Darwin, with Darwin's evolution, that that it, it seemed to be ah we're getting uh, science away from theology and that, that there was uh when, when you look at the uh history of science it was the church which is the roman catholic church which was mainly in control of science research at, in galileo's time and even in newton newton was uh i think he's a priest wasn't he he, he sort of like uh, no, he wasn't a priest, but he he, he, he was in. Uh, he, he it's sort of like science was still part part was combined with religion. Yeah, religion religion yeah. had a big uh, connection to science. Yeah, it was univers a well, university in those days. Now it's a multiversity. Yeah. But then, then academia with Darwin wanted to bring in atheism, where they wanted science to be atheist. But, so but, they, but, but Darwin thought that this every living cell was fairly simple, and soon they know all about it. Now, nowadays, we know that every living cell, no matter how simple, is incredibly yeah. complicated. Yeah, they have mitochondria and all sorts of things that you yeah. that aren't really understood even yet. Yeah. And, and so the idea that uh, everything could become from randomness, which was Darwin's idea, is ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, it's a uh, they, they wanted an atheist science and so that's what yeah. they've gone for so there's a big hidden agenda to do that those either i looked into it and there's a group of uh scientists they called themselves the x club and they used to meet for uh, dinner part parties and they would discuss how to break science away from being tied to religion a religious perspective and they wanted to make it science uh, atheists so uh, that there was a definite uh, movement by influential scientists to make uh, science atheist yeah Poincaré was the last uh, truly religious physicist was he? oh yeah and uh, his books according to Bill Lucas yeah his books uh, are now not available anymore they're locked away yeah. They're, they're dangerous. Uh, but it's sort of like when, when, when I when I've gone to uh, when I've I've gone on various relativity courses, and I try to point out to them that experiments can be interpreted by uh, other than Einstein's relativity. Why don't you teach that? Uh, and what they what they want to say is to that is they're being paid to teach Einstein's relativity, not to teach other theories. And so that's how they can discard things like Poincaré's theory and all that. They say they've got their theory they're promoting. It's it is like propaganda. Yeah. R really, <laughs> where, you, where you, you're, you're only presenting one point of view, and the point of view is they've they've taken the Einstein is right, but then the point of view they're taking of Einstein is their own biased point of view of it because. They take, seem to be taking Einstein 1905 with, when he's discarded ether as opposed to when he brought it back again. So they're in, so it's all, it's all like political. Yeah. And nowadays the, the name of the game is paradigm protection. Yeah. Yeah. You, you've got to have peers that will uh, agree with what you're saying to get, get published. Yeah. And that's why I think with Gleese, when he doesn't uh, straight out go and say, 
Einstein wrong as the title is paper. He doesn't yeah, say that. He wouldn't have been published if he said that. If he said that, he wouldn't be published. Yeah, that's what I think. He wouldn't be published. But if he titles it as Problems in Relativity, that's the way he's done it. And that's, that's a more acceptable title. Yeah, so you and, buy, then, you... And, then, and then people can, can uh, re, you know, reply to his article. Yeah. Uh, uh, as uh, presenting a solution to this problem or a solution to that problem. Yeah. But based on what? Well, uh, something vague and. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Einstein's vague, I think. And so that's people start putting their own interpretation onto things. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, is that it? I survived another session. <laughs> is, is that? I can start talking about what we do next time. You got there's no more questions, is there? I think I think I've survived the questions. So so hopefully. I'm going to be doing more anti-relativity talks. Uh, and the next planned idea is I want to do one on relativistic mass. And when I when they taught me relativity ages ago, they, they were saying there was relativistic mass. But now there's sort of people who believe in uh, Einstein's relativity. And they're saying that uh, relativistic mass was a mistake. And Einstein's relativity doesn't have relativistic mass. So it means that, oh, they got relativity wrong when they taught it to me decades ago. And so, well, well surely it's a different theory that they're teaching now. When they, when they taught me it, taught me relativity, there was a theory of rel relativistic mass. And now they're trying to get around that and say, the theory has no relativistic mass. And so, oh, They've changed the theory. And that's my point of view on it. Well, we uh, but, do have people, Roger, we do have people. Uh, okay. James is waving to you, so you can go well, ahead. Oh, oh, my pitch is too slow. I've blocked. I've made the screen bigger, and it's moved people down, so I can't see them. Sorry. Yeah, we've I'll make it smaller. Uh, I'll make it. I'll make it. I'll make it smaller again, so I can't can't read the thing anymore. And we do have a full two hours, so you do have like up to another half. Okay, hour. so who next? Who next? Who's got a question? I think Jay, James is waving. Okay, go ahead, James. Go ahead. Go James. ahead, and you have to click on his click on his picture. To click on his up. picture. Enter stage. Oh. Yes, enter oh. stage. Oh, hi. Hello, oh. everybody. Thank you, Franklin uh, and Roger. Uh, <clears throat> hi. And actually, Sorry about uh, that. I, no pro problem, man. Uh, um, I, I think the SINAC results uh, pre present a, a great opportunity. What we need is a new set of first principles to explain the uh, certain unexplained results, such as the actual uh, unexplained measurements of the nominal value of the vacuum light speed and so forth. Uh, I might give like an economic uh, analogy here. It's like we need a new product, but most people in the industry are completely out of the game because they're unaware that a new product, in other words, a theory that is adequate, yeah. uh, is needed so that there's almost no competition. This represents a great opportunity for investigators to come up with something new. Um, uh, in other words, there's a lack of competition, and a small group of us can uh, actually forge the way. Now, I it seems to me that we're in favor here with the SINAC results uh, of uh, some kind of a fixed or preferred frame. It turns out that um, all of this seems to be a great boost to my work in binary mechanics, which I would like to comment on um, uh, as an observer of it, not as the principal, okay? Pre pretend I'm looking at what binary mechanics has published. Here you have the only mathematical definition of a fixed and preferred frame, which has led to 
obtaining the value, the nominal NIST, you know, accepted uh, light speed, vacuum light speed va value of C from first principles. So what we need is, and, and there's no competition to this mathematical definition, which has been presented by whoever the jerk is that developed binary mechanics. I, I say with a, a touch of humor, if you will. So yeah. we have a great opportunity here. Uh, right now, uh, this mathematical definition uh, doesn't depend upon any unexplained measured values for E, C, H, or any of the other so-called basic constants, and mm -hmm. yet it, it, it yields the values of those constants from first principles. There's uh, what I think is that we need some competition. Is this the only possible way to uh, uh, obtain these uh, unexplained values and measurements from first principles, or are there other approaches? Mm -hmm. So the great opportunity to close yeah. is, is that uh, what we have here is a, 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 a great opportunity and no competition because almost everyone else, all the believers in special relativity, for example, are out of the game. They're sort of dead wood, so huh. that uh, it's a great opportunity to come up with something new and go beyond merely saying what is old is incorrect. Uh -huh. So thank you for this uh, platform, and uh, yeah. uh, if need be, I, I'd be happy to clarify the, yeah. the, the, the point I'm trying to make. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, yeah, I think with the, uh, you're talking about a research project, what gets people motivated if they sort of have money and sort of academia, if they suddenly find they find themselves interested in an idea and they're willing to promote academics to research it, then that's, that's uh, gets, draws people in. It's sort of, it's only sort of like people of ledger uh, and who don't have to worry about money, they get pulled into this, uh, Einstein is wrong sort of research. This Einstein is wrong research doesn't really get funded. So therefore academia is not getting a well, organized. We don't need so much more Einstein is wrong research. What we need is actually research oh. to uh, forge a new pathway, a new mathematical definition of a fixed or uh, preferred frame and, mm -hmm. and uh, advanced physics in that way by breaking new ground, not just simply saying that the ground that we've been walking on is faulty. Okay. So, no, in other words, I'm uh, proposing or uh, promoting a more creative approach rather than just saying, well, those guys are wrong. Yeah. Once we've said those guys are wrong, you know, 10, 15, 100 times, uh, we're still in the same place. Nowhere. What, what, what the we people, need is creative the, minds to, I yeah. would like to see some competition to the definitions in the math of binary mechanics. Where is it? Yeah. Well, well on the benefit, on the relativity, when, <laughs> when, when we're saying that, when they're saying that the certain academics are wrong about relativity, those academics and so forth are not accepting that. So that that's what blocks that. Well, that's that. the opportunity. They're out yeah. of the game. Those yeah. of us who recognize that they're wrong, Roger yeah. and others here, um, have the opportunity to forge and uh, new ground in physics, whereas those that are out of the game, yeah. they're, they're just dead, dead wood, and they'll <laughs> die, die off. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Uh, I'm oh, I, 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 the bit back there. Approach. The bit back where they die off. I don't really see that because they still get funded. If you if you're doing relativity research, you still get funded in academia for that. It's just the Einstein is wrong. It's not being funded. Why, so, why, how, how can, how can why they, Einstein is wrong 
be funded. Well, they, 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 is, they, well, is, is there any doubt that Einstein is wrong after well, all of the presentations that we've had over many, many years here in this yeah. forum? Oh, we, we, uh, I, I don't think so. Well, what okay. I do see is a lack of, of people trying to forge a new path mm -hmm. to replace that. Well, well, people have tried forging new paths. I think I think I've seen things like a thing called Millennium Relativity and so forth, and they're trying to look at it differently. And there's uh, Stephen Crothers, who points out a lot of things wrong with relativity, and I think he comes up with his own theory in the end. So those people are trying to forge a path to replace relativity. It's just a question that the academia is not accepting that they're really stuck in the mud with do, believing do, Einstein. Do any of them come up with the uh, measured va value for uh, nominal value for uh, vacuum light speed from first principles? No, none. So that, well, you know, like in the Sinek experiment, if, 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 if that's so important, you'd think that every single detail about that experiment would be examined with a fine tooth comb. The mirrors, the splitters, does it matter? The frequency of the light that's used. And of course, the so-called constant C, uh, yeah. or, or is it constant, uh, which is actually an unexplained observation. Yeah, You'd think that would be the focus. Not, mm -hmm. not uh, you know, uh, that's how science advances by examining the unexplained features of of our our our, our observations. Anyway, I think I tried to make okay. my point. Probably overly done so. So I'll, okay. I'll see, thank you. Uh, I'll stand down, as it were. <laughs> thank you, Jess. I think I think people have tried doing that, but okay. Thank you. Well, uh, apparently there's been no success if they've tried. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I think a lot of the problem is that people get too old in the end. Sort of like uh, when, when I was young in the 20s, uh, you just accepted pretty much what the teachers and the lecturers were telling you. And then, then you get more critical. And then when you get into your 60s, you say, oh, I can't, if, I, if you tie, so I've got more time to research this. But then, then you just get too old, and so like, and then you pass away, and it's on to the next person. It's sort of like it's the distance. Well, the opportunity is out there, regardless of your age. Yeah, I, I don't feel young enough to take on a new challenge anymore. It's kind of like a research project, that which is going in a different directions to what I'm going. I don't feel young and fresh enough to be dynamic enough to go and do that anymore because i've spent so much time uh, criticizing uh, einstein's relativity and so forth and suddenly to leave that and go to something else it's got too old now and set my ways but i think that that sort of thing happens to a lot of people they get too old in the end thank you well thanks roger thank you who else? Is that it? Oh, another hand. Add to stage. Oh, there we go. <gasps> Nick. Hi, Nick. You're still muted. You're muted, I think. You're still muted. Speaking about people getting too old, uh, yeah. I have a few comments. Um, old, yeah. <laughs> notice the white hair. Um, Cornelius asked about what is the Lorentz transformation have to do with uh, gravitation. Well, yeah. basically, Lorentz um, transformation covered the same domain as special relativity. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, uh, what Einstein did was take the Lorentz transformation that was based on a single preferred frame, namely the ether rest frame. And in essence, he claimed that every inertial frame was the single preferred frame, yeah. which is a fundamental contradiction. Uh, and that's why sometimes, like for radiative effects, you get the uh, uh, 
agreement with special relativity, but physically mm -hmm. you're using that equation uh, consistent with Lorentz theory, namely a yeah. frame theory. Um, Cornelius asked about um, so Cornelius asked about uh, what does Rentz say about gravitation? Well, nothing specifically, but as uh, Dr. Greist said, if you no longer claim that the light speed is constant, um, you can quickly derive the Schwarzschild solution for for uh, gravity. So the Lorentz um, uh, theory, which is based on Euclidean geometry rather than Riemannian geometry, can be quickly extended to um, account for gravitation. Um, a couple of comments about what Dennis was saying. He was saying that uh, while a resistance uh, uh, and, uh, to or a strong adherence to special relativity was due to the anti-religious and really the political uh, affiliations of academia. And it suited them to have mm -hmm. the idea that there was no absolute, there's everything is relative. And that's one of the main reasons they stuck to it, despite all of the problems with it and disagreement with um, uh, the data, such as the GPS system has shown. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and by the way, that that does not mean that this group is, is basing their view of physics on religion. We're just saying that if if some aspect of physics agrees with religion, it's no reason to dismiss that aspect of physics. Um, yeah, the Big Bang theory sort of like agreed with uh, religion at one time, didn't it? And they sort of like some right, the people, some right. of the atheists. Some of the atheists are trying to go against the uh, Big Bang theory with the idea that there's a creation of the universe. Right, and the evidence so seems all... to be it seems to be dismissing, uh, dismissing the Big Bang theory, or at least changing yeah. it dramatically. Yeah. Um, so, a lot of the arguments go over into religious thinking. James was suggesting we we should go beyond just saying you guys are wrong, but I think Dr. Mm -hmm. Reese's presentation was very eloquent yeah. about, hey, there is a, an alternative. It's not a new alternative. It's one that yeah. existed before Einstein. Yeah. And it really solves all of the all of the terrific flaws of uh, relativity that, mm -hmm. are, that are anti-physics, really. That's uh, right, yeah. And, and uh, yeah. by the way, Dr. Grease was uh, not saying there was no ether. He would just... He, in contrast, he was saying there must be a preferred frame. Yeah. Um, and one final thing, there's been a very active thread, email thread about uh, Stephen Giffs promoting the Solari transformations. And I oh, thought yeah. that this presentation was a wonderful crushing uh, argument against going that way because it's far too complex. Hmm. And I think he made that point extremely well. That's all I have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Okay. Good. Right. I'm on the laptop. My eyes are not really up to seeing screens that are too small. So sorry if I'm missing people out. Is there any more hands going to come up? Any more hands? No. Oh, there. No. Is somebody moving? <laughs> I don't see any hands. Harry. There it is right there. Oh, I'm, okay. I'm blind. Um, I'm okay. blind on a small laptop. I have a lot to comment on. And okay, Harry, good. Because Sorry. people have yeah. way talked away the time. Yeah. Uh, Nick stole, excuse me, let me just say, Nick stole a lot of my thunder that I was going to yeah. talk about. Very little people have discussed the content of the presentation. Nick, I think, was the only one that really talked about what was said in the presentation. So in the future, I would like to 
I would appreciate it if you could restrict the conversation to the particular presentation that's being discussed. Okay, having said that, my question about the presentation is, yeah. if Einstein's theory of relativity is correct, the speed mm -hmm. of light should be the same whether the platform is rotating or at rest. Mm -hmm. That, I think, is the point of the Sagnac experiment. The Sagnac experiment wow. shows there's a difference in fringe shift when the platform is rotating and when it's at rest. So wow. that implies that the Einstein theory is wrong because Einstein's theory would say that the speed of light is the same on the platform in motion as it is when it's at rest. Is that not what you would expect if the postulate that Einstein uses is correct? If you, if you quote in the postulates, it doesn't say anything about rotation. Well, the Post platform one into, rotates, that's the whole point in the Sagnac experiment. Yeah, that, that's the point of the experiment. So the, the, the postulates don't seem to say what's supposed to happen when the uh, you've got rotation. And as as per what uh, uh, Gies was pointing out, the it, when Einstein deals with time and clocks, that, that seems to be a third exception being added onto it. And so you, well, he, he takes a different approach. He uses yeah. the approach that according yeah. to Einstein's synchronization, the velocity of the light in the, the two different directions has to be the same. And so therefore, mm -hmm. by his synchronization postulate, he's saying that the velocity in both directions around the table, remember that there are two directions the light is going around the table in the clockwise direction and it's going around the table in the counterclockwise direction and his argument is that the speeds have to be the same in both directions according to the einstein light synchronization postulate and that's evidently not true according to the results of the experiment yeah so that basically falsifies einstein's theory yeah but unfortunately f f from my perspective that's an interpretation of einstein it's because he's not explicitly stating things clearly and it's not einstein. explicitly stating things the criticism of dr geese or einstein? No, einstein is not explicitly stating things clearly as to because well, he's, no, he's, he's explicitly stating his postulate that the speed of light is a constant Yes. Is that not correct? Yeah. Not well, you, stated in all the books, and Dr. Geese started yeah. out by saying that, as I recall. He actually mm -hmm. went over what the postulate is, and he stated that postulate, the postulate of relativity and the speed of light postulate in the frame of the way it appears in modern textbooks. Yeah. Okay. And then he proceeded in his presentation to say that, no, uh, the Sagnat experiment was not consistent with those postulates mm -hmm. and gave a very convincing argument that this was the case. So yeah. it's to me like he falsified his argument that special relativity oh, is, false, is essentially yeah. consistent with his argument. So I think he proved yeah. that relativity is false because experiments, physical experiments, one being the Sagnat experiment, experiment in particular. Now, he also did talk about the uh, uh, gyro optic, um, um, optical gyroscope. Yeah. Okay. And, um, and, and, and we've had presentations in the NPA going back a number of years where people yeah. have, talked about, have talked about the optical gyroscope and, yeah. uh, and this whole thing. So the question then is, why does the relative... Uh, so, in my opinion, he's disproved, his presentation disproved special relativity. I think his argument that Lorentz relativity is supported by the experiments is a very solid argument. And therefore, uh, he's also made the other argument, and I think very interestingly, that Lorentz relativity is simpler and not as confusing and doesn't lead to 
um, paradoxes and lots of nonsense uh, that we're all aware of. So we should be pursuing the Lorentz view, view version and just discard Einstein. So that kind of basically says we are moving in this direction. Dr. Deese is moving in this direction in his presentation. So I think that uh, the way we should be going is Lorentz relativity or Lorentz theory, not yeah. relativity. Lorentz has a different version of the theory. So I think the argument is fairly clearly made by the presentation that we saw today that relativity is false and that Lorentz's version of the theory is the correct theory that should be pursued. Yeah, probably. I think so. Yeah. We, we're, Lorentz came up with his theory before Einstein and when Einstein came up with his, Einstein came up with Einstein's theory, it's sort of like created all the confusion. Um, so I think we're heading in the right direction. We're not. Yeah. Uh, we're we're making we're heading in the correct direction. I think we have the correct physical principles. Uh, we understand what the correct foundational theory is that it's the Lorentz version, mm -hmm. not the Einstein version. Okay. Yeah. This leads to the benefits, as Dr. Geese pointed out, a number of benefits that it's simpler, it's easier to understand, gets rid of all the stupid uh, paradoxes and um, um, all the problems of misinterpretation and misunderstanding and uh, disagreement that results from the vagueness and the obscurity of, of the basically fundamental postulates of the theory. Uh, mm -hmm. What does the principle of relativity mean? You know, Einstein doesn't really tell yeah. us. Yeah. What does he mean when he says the speed yeah. of your velocity of light is a constant? He doesn't really tell us. It's yeah, just vague, vague and obscure. Vague. Yeah, that's it. It's, so what Einstein says is a lot of time vague and obscure. And if you went to Lorentz, you, you'd have a lot of things clarified. But okay, I so spent, just in, in finishing yeah. here, basically, I did go over a bunch of books. And yeah. what I discovered is out of 40 books on relativity that I have, I only uh, mainstream books, I only had one that mm -hmm. even mentioned the Sadnack experiment. Mm -hmm. And that book didn't, it gave a completely horrible discussion of it, which couldn't, I couldn't make any sense out of. Yeah. So essentially, if they ignore the Sagnac experiment, then, you know, they don't want to put it in the textbooks because it's not really something they can explain. Okay. Yeah. Now, yeah. in the dissident books, uh, out of a number of dissident books, about half of them mention uh, the Sagnac effect. So the Sagnac effect is very important to the dissident community because they see that as an important experiment. Yeah. Whereas on the other hand, the mainstream people would rather have it go away. Yeah. I, that could be it, but uh, the... Uh dissidents that i don't think they all absolutely 100 percent agree that the sanac disproves uh, special relativity you, you've got split from them as well but w w when i what one of the things i do is i sort of argue with people about relativity i go to different talks and uh, different uh, groups of people where different i've been to oxford where you teach relativity to people oh i can't see very well <laughs> it's too small for me are you familiar with this book I, what's the name of it einstein the ether and variable rest mass uh, who's it by by this guy named jack hagway h no. i g h w a y well no. i suggest that you if you're going to talk about variable rest mass and uh, yeah. the whole issue I suggest you try to get a, uh, maybe there's a reference on the internet. It says, okay. I find the ether and variable rest mass. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he basically criticizes uh, Einstein and the rest. His main focus is on the rest mass uh, issue. Yeah. I so I suggest you take a look at this uh, for your presentation where you're discussing variable rest mass. Good. Great. Okay, uh, I, I was gonna, I was gonna uh, just really put on a video of uh, Don Lincoln talking about it, 
and then open that up to discussion. But I, I can look at the other things like that. But on the issue, or where well, I point out, I argue with people about relativity, and I think some of the people that do believe in Einstein's relativity, what they really do is they don't believe in what Einstein is claiming to be relativity, but they do believe in Lorentz, his version of relativity, and they just don't really, really realise that what they're believing is Lorentz theory, and then they're accidentally calling it Einstein's relativity. But the, the, it just you just get this big conflict with people with all their different ideas and how they've misinterpreted or interpreting things differently. So basically, relativity is a mess. All right. Well, we've come to the, the end of our two hours. Yeah. And uh, so I think uh, you sum things up and we can uh, go ahead and end the stream. All right. Thank you. So I hope you've enjoyed this uh, summing up. I hope you, hope you enjoyed this uh, talk by Albrecht uh, Gleese and realize that there are papers being published which seem to be in the mainstream criticizing Einstein's relativity. And you seem to be able to get away with criticize, criticizing relativity if you if you're going to not openly come out and say that Einstein is wrong, just instead say that there's a problem with relativity, and saying that is a more acceptable thing to the mainstream. And I've also, and what we really highlighted here is the problem with understanding the Sanak experiment. Uh, it's not really a big being open up to people who believe well open up as a big issue to people being taught relativity that there's a problem with interpreting the sanak experiment they don't go into details about that and when you sort of look into the sanak experiment and you have your belief about light speed being constant uh well it doesn't really seem to fit properly and then you've got to Mental, do a bit of mental jiggling to juggling, mental juggling to try to fit it into Einstein's Einstein's relativity. If you want to still believe in that, so it's all it's all kind of big issue of uh, mess in relativity. Thank you. Mm. Okay, thank you. I hope to go into more details about other problems with relativity and lots of other uh, anti-relativity so, so, so talks. All you need to do is click on the end stream button and... Uh, right. Okay. Sorry then. Goodbye then. Bye, everybody. See you hopefully next time. Next time I'll be back again. I think I'm getting the hang of things a bit more now. Thank you. Bye. Exit. End a session.